Hey everyone, Walter Crosby, your host of Sales and Cigars. Um, have a uh, episode today that uh, had gone back and forth getting it scheduled. Um, uh, we both admitted that we were a little hesitant to, to, to actually get it done because of the, the rescheduling, but we're both happy that we uh, that we did. Jeremy Pope is my guest, um, and he's a, an interesting character, entrepreneur. He's got a great story to tell about how he got to where he's doing. He's, uh, um, he, he's, he's got some really cool frameworks to help entrepreneurs who are uh, in that, that early phase of, of just getting going and contemplating what their next moves are. Um, we have a little overlap in, in what we do, but um, it, it was a fun conversation uh, to th- help you think a little differently about sales. So if you're an entrepreneur or senior sales executive, go grab a cocktail, grab a cigar, strap in for another fun episode of Sales and Cigars. Thanks. So Jeremy, I appreciate you taking some time uh, out of your busy schedule to, to jump on the podcast and have a conversation. It's my pleasure. I'm enjoying our conversation already. Yeah, we had some fun in the in what we call the green room to uh, kind of make sure that we're on the same page. And I think we're like-minded individuals in how we view the sales profession. So um, let's jump in. A um, couple of questions. Like I, I like to start like to give the audience a little chance to understand who you are. So can you talk about your journey to where you are and how you got to um, being an overholic, um, as you say? Sure. Um I started in sales at age 19 uh, when I was in my dropout year of college, my first year of college, incidentally. And I was selling door-to-door wearing a coat and tie um, at attorney's offices who I hoped would need real estate title abstraction services, uh, title search services as they close a, a loan, as they close a transaction. What state was this in? This was in Georgia, in South Georgia, in the hot summer sun, which lasts for 10 months out of the year. So uh, being during the school year didn't help at all. So uh, that was that was my first experience, just trying to figure things out from scratch. That was when I was reading, uh, starting to read J. Conrad Levinson of Guerrilla Marketing and Dan Kennedy. And I didn't know anything about anything at that point. But uh, yeah, they They did. did. Yeah, they they took care of me. It was good stuff. So I did that for a little while. Um, that carried me through for a bit. And I'm, I'm a smart guy, and I used to think it mattered. And so I did at least <laughs> use the smarts of a very high SAT score to, I think I missed three or four questions on the SAT. And so I, I used that as my credentials to do some SAT prep consulting. And I got a few clients doing that. And um, I was having some memory issues, like where am I putting things? Um, not Alzheimer's, but part-timers kind of thing. So <laughs> I uh, started doing some self-hypnosis to improve my memory. And I uh, did that for three or four days, and I started remembering where I put everything. And I started thinking, well, what else can I use this for? So that kind of got me into self-hypnosis. And then I uh, started talking about it and just... I'm an advocate for anything I do. I can't help it but be an evangelist. I'm the, I'm the dancing monkey out front. Just If I'm excited, I, I'm trying to get everybody else excited, you know? So having, uh, having the conversations with clients and their, their parents about all that stuff, I started doing hypnosis with my SAT prep clients and then started helping some clients' moms stop smoking. A lot of people... Um, back then in Georgia, it was probably 25% of the Georgia population smoked at that point, and more in small towns. Not the good stuff, not the cigars, but like the pack-a-day cigarettes kind of stuff. The Chesterfields and the Marlboro. Right, yeah. right. So um, that kind of got me into the hypnosis field and uh, trained in NLP, the Tony Robbins type stuff. And that is where I learned how to sell. I, I got a mentor after a year or two. Uh, that taught me how to do the free consult setup, which I was extremely resistant to at first because it lowered my hourly rate. Like two meetings instead of one to to help somebody quit smoking? Come on, come on. So uh, being able to move into that was probably my first breakthrough in sales in two ways. One was understanding the give value first approach 
and two was what I now call the million dollar ear process, just how to listen properly. If, if hypnosis worked the way we th- people think it does, I would never tell anyone I'm a hypnotist. But unfortunately, you still have to learn all the marketing and sales skills, and you have to learn to be a decent psychologist in order to persuade effectively. But that was that was kind of the genesis of my real sales career there, not just kind of hacking it out by myself, figuring things out as a youngster. Did you learn anything going door to door in a suit? Uh, sport coat and tie to, to calling on lawyers like i mean besides just getting your nose bloodied with people slamming doors and stuff what um what did you learn from that because that's a um, tough audience they, they were very kind um that i mean they you I, I was georgia. yeah that's true. um the, the the people is the only thing i like about south georgia honestly I, I have a lot of friends down there still i grew up there and so uh if if it weren't 98 degrees Fahrenheit, 98% humidity, and 2% gnats, I would, I, there's a good chance I'd still be down there. But I, I had to move around a bit because I, I just had to get away from the weather. So learning learning in that, it, it's a, it's it, it really is, yeah. Um, I, I learned that it's, it, that was probably where I started learning the WIIFM kind of thing. It it doesn't matter what my features and benefits are. It matters, do they have a need? And can I access that need? Hmm. And I I was very clumsy about it back then. So I I honestly can't say I learned a lot. Um, But I I did start paying attention to that framework in... I guess I probably knew about it vaguely. But um, I, I was not learning sales at that point. I was just trying to get faster at doing title searches. I, I was more in that e-myth, the, the entrepreneurial seizure, which I've had many over the years, but the, the frustrated technician kind of thing. I, I, I thought I could be a technician and mm-hmm. get away with it instead of a business owner. And so uh, that's, that's yeah. kind of where I was at that point. In, in, in Gerber's book, uh, the e-myth, he talks, it, I think he does a great example of, that everybody can relate to is the mechanic. Yeah. Right, where the great mechanic, you should open up your own shop, and then the great mechanic has no idea how to pay yeah. an electric bill and and you know pay payroll taxes and such, and it just gets him into trouble. Um, really, my only so cost I, I, was from, my time and my gas, so it was a very low barrier to entry sort of business. Just obscure obscurity was the only barrier to entry. Yeah, I, but I, I think the. Aside from the weather, like my experience doing basic sales and stumbling around and not really knowing what you're doing was in New York City um, and doing commercial real estate. So uh, so you would have to, and I'm 23 years old, I, I, and I'm trying to get Yeah, start, starting with some tough stuff there. Yeah, and, and New Yorkers are very warm and um open and willing to give you lots of time to to <laughs> learn your craft that um so you know you would i would make 425 dials a day um and talk to maybe five people and three of those people were yelling at me um but it's it, i learned discipline and that you need to get better at it you need to like for me i had to get to the point um real quickly and there was no training nobody ever told me you know, anything that was helpful, um, they, and if you gave them too much information, somebody would try to, you know, steal your opportunities. So, um, it, it was, a it, it was, it was a tenacity, I think was what, what I walked away from and, and saying that I could do something, yeah. which has always been a driver for me. And I think I'm, I'm not sure I ever learned the tenacity part of things. I, I always wanted to learn that. And, so the it, the working genius poster behind you, mm. my working genius is wonder and galvanization. Mm. And then invention and discernment is next and enablement and tenacity. Those are my zones of frustration there, even now at age 41. And so there, there are some things I've just had to accept. Okay, yes, correct the flaws in character. Like if we've got sin and the need for repentance going on, yes, absolutely, de- deal there. But... If this is just something that's out of my wheelhouse, where it's not the the natural gifting and skill sets that I'm passionate about, um, then 
okay, let's let's delegate, right? Please, Lord, let's delegate. <laughs> well, it, it, that's the beauty of the of of Lencioni's model is to be able to. <clears throat> these are the things that give me energy, and I need to do these. And these are the things over here that I just to just drain me. Like I, I, maybe I can do them. Maybe there's this lesser level of confidence, but I just don't want to do them. And, and it, it, I, I discovered yesterday that the Colby A index that I took years and years ago, 2018, it turns out, I, I was looking at it again because a friend was asking me something about it. And it had some pieces that I had totally forgotten existed, like the how much time you ought to consider spending on the fact finder, um, follow through, quick start, and implementer areas of a project. Mm-hmm. There, there, there's a little bit of overlap with Colby A and with the working genius stuff. Working genius is a lot easier to use, in my opinion. It's simpler. But, um, yeah, yeah. Um, and way simpler than the book. Kathy Colby got way in the weeds with the book. <laughs> so not, not my favorite, but I like, I like the assessment and it would, it surprised me that I'd forgotten that piece, but it was, it was just a good reminder. Okay. Here, here's a way to use that working genius type of approach of, okay, if I'm drained by this, what percentage of my time can I get away with spending on that thing? And I realized just yesterday, I'm spending way too much time on troubleshooting things or in the ops or fulfillment department with my team. I'm like, no, okay, it's time to go back up to the KPI and put it back on them and just just hold hold accountability for them rather than getting into it with them. That, but that's, that's frustrating. That's hard to do sometimes. It is. When you're the entrepreneur and you're at the at the top of the of the org chart um and we have a tendency to think we can do it better which is probably true in it's some often, cases often true. not always I'm, I'm lucky that i'm incompetent at most things but for for most things there there's that temptation well yeah, it, yeah but we we still be, there's certain a belief there when when we really kind of get uh clear in ourselves and honest with ourselves i'm a wd so i'm great at like why the hell are we doing it this way I don't, I don't understand. Like, does this make any sense? So I'm good at that component. And then I'm really good at, you know, the, the discernment component of like, well, that's, that part there is good, but what if we tweaked it? Right. But the innovation part of trying to figure out a better way, not a skill set. I mean, that's one of my, that's one of the ones that suck the energy out of me. Um, and I'm, I can do galvanizing. I can, you know, get people excited about it. But not for a long period of time. Right? If you're not on board, I, I, I don't know that I need to. Um, it it it's kind of sucks the energy out of me. And I I'm disciplined with myself, but I don't like forcing other people to do things. Yes. That tenaciousness is how he refers to that. And um, yeah, it, that's a. This is an interesting from a sales leadership standpoint. Um, the the way that I have to approach a lot of projects that I can't afford to get involved with because I do have the wonder and the galvanization that get people excited, rally the troops, et cetera, build the community. Like everything I do is group, 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 group. Like, Hey, I'm going to do this thing. You want to do it with me? A book club, I learn chat GPT. I, I started a Facebook group with, to learn AI prompting. I start a Facebook group to do this. I start a, a club to do that. Like I can't help it because Partly in your because DNA. of the galvanization thing, but partly because of the ADHD. And so I just, if I don't have people around me to give me that extra little nudge of accountability, like they're depending on me, I don't do anything. So th- this has affected the way I fulfill in my own business. Um, I do not create things on the back end. I do not do homework. I do not prepare things. I do not propose things. I do not like I draw with digital crayons and then I hand it off and (laughs) I show up on zoom and I give people my 100% full attention and that's it. And when I'm gone, I'm gone. I'm not going to like, I have a hard time remembering to introduce people that I'm really excited to introduce. I love introducing people and and helping them make a deal and stuff like that. But I I mean, it's, it's hard to remember to do Mm. just the tracking and all that stuff. So I have to be really careful to, 
kind of stay in my lane, but in a good way. I love my lane, and I'm very happy to stay in it whenever I feel that I can. But, but, but knowing that and knowing where your boundaries are um, as an entrepreneur is, is really important. Um, and knowing when you're, because we're always going to cross, cross out of bounds, right? And it's good to give our, and, and the, so the working genius model gives, gives us, gives our team license to say, hey, Jeremy, this is an innovation meeting. This isn't a galvanizing meeting. So let's get this right before we start getting excited about it. Right. And should you even be in that meeting? And you, the answer is probably yes, but so you understand where they're going and you'll, you'll have opinions obviously, but it, to me, it's like, it's a great way to say, this is what we're supposed to do. And if we need to go back and do something else, didn't we, did we finish that or, or should we have called that the way it is? Right. It, it, but we've got to be clear about where those, where those boundaries are. And I, I'm good at going out of bounds. It's something I've done my whole life. I, I, I remember I was in, I got hired at a company and um, I worked for a really smart guy uh, that I learned a lot from, but he was awful at managing people. And uh, yeah, I remember I, we were like, I said, what are the boundaries here? Where can I go with this? And he's like, well, there, it's, clear, it's clear. You can do this and you can do this. You can't do anything else. I'm like, ah, I'm going to go out of bounds, right? So, you know, I, I need a little bit more latitude over here. And he's like, why do you want to go out of bounds? And I'm like, it's just, it's where the interesting part of life is, is over there. Right. And we're going to we're going to make some deals and we're going to try to figure things out. But I said, I promise you, I will tell you, I'll be the first one to tell you I went out of bounds. And every time I did that, I went to him and there was one time I screwed up. I made a big mistake. and I went in there. And I said, hey, this is going to cost us about five grand. And he's like, us. I'm like, yeah, us. You're going to take it into shorts on the on the equipment piece of it, and I'm going to take it into shorts on the commissions because you're not going to pay me. So yeah, this is a us scenario. So he said, sit down, and we went through 45 minutes of figuring out how to get the five grand back, and then add another 10 grand because we found another problem that the owner didn't know about, and we could introduce it before it became a big thing and do it all well, and. So, I mean, that we, we did the right thing for the customer, but it all started because somebody took responsibility for their screw up. Yeah. Yeah. And Josh Braun is a sales trainer that actually he, he would probably make a great interview. He would. Um, I, I'll introduce you if, if that works out. Um, and he, he talks about poking the bear or another, another thing he talks about is, is you're not asking for a problem. You're not requesting a problem. You're finding a problem. Mm -hmm. So it's your job as a salesperson to find the problem, not just to sit there and hope that they spoon feed you with their problem. It's our job the, to uncover the, that, to bring it out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We've, we've got a shovel. We've got all the shovels we need as salespeople. I mean, we have our sales tools, our, our questions that we can get anywhere we need to go with good questions. And he, and he illuminates that really well. In, yeah. in like his own life, right? Where a contractor will come in and say, yep. you know, yep. the tree's laying on your yeah, roof. Yeah, he tells a lot of good stories. Yeah, mm -hmm. he does. Um, so does his wife. Um, mm. So I'll have to pay attention to her too. Yeah, they did a sequence of uh, like, you know, how to teach my wife sales. And Oh, right. I forgot about that. Yeah. And there's some yeah. really good lessons there. Um, she's charming and, and funny and self-effacing. And, you know, they bring in her mom. Uh, uh, they don't bring her into the interviews, but they use the stories. Um, right, right. And he's, I don't know, I just find him funny and, uh, and educational. He does a lot of good work. And, and I think that's one of the things that, um, that salespeople could do more of is that uncovering component and finding, right, by asking the right questions, not using them as a weapon, but doing it as a way to help somebody that's our goal is to help someone um this is the, the same thing as the challenger sale as well the challenger salespeople they're not here to browbeat you but when they can find an element i dude i have made so many sales where i get to show off the depth of a question when when somebody says 
oh, nobody else I've talked to has asked me that. I'm like, all right, I, I got the sale 70% closed right here, right now. Yep. If it's a good enough question that it really sparks them in that way and it's something nobody else is asking, it's usually fundamental stuff too. Well, this is l- like it's fundamental like to you, but not necessarily to them because they they see the world through their lens, not ours, right? Yeah, but I th- I think of it as fundamental to fulfilling well on like to actually solving this problem for them. If if there are a lot of people, a lot of vendors, sales trainers, even uh, sales staffing, I, I do some recruiting and staffing type of stuff occasionally, and when there are staffing companies out there, I probably get it more around that than, than any other area, but they're not asking questions that will enable the new salespeople to succeed on this funnel or in this sales process or however you think of it in your business. But when, when, when those questions are not being asked, but like, how will we know when we've got, everything in place sort of questions. I mean, that's, that's the concept level. I, I can't think of an example at the moment, but um, when, when everybody else is not asking questions that prove you're thinking about the fulfillment side, you're thinking about the success side of things, it makes it instantly obvious that I'm the standout vendor, that I care about the actual success of the project not making the sale. So when you start asking fulfillment and sales and success related uh, questions, it really gives you a chance to show off a giver mentality and, and to stand out from the pack. It, um, I mean, the, it, what's interesting is that the words you use, the language you use is a little different than mine, but there's, their meanings are exactly the Always. same, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for that compelling reason that somebody's going to do something, and it, to be compelling for the prospect or the customer, it has to take something off their plate. Have to save them time. Have to save them money. It's got to be meaningful to them, and we do that by asking a series of questions. Right? It's asking enough questions, but you know, asking good questions and great questions and tough questions, and. And, and uh, you know, I was talking to a salesperson the other day, and, and he said, "Well, how do I know I ask a great question?" I'm like, they will tell you. That's a great question, right? And they'll tell you, like, "Well, that's a tough one." Oh, right? And whenever somebody puts their hand to their chin and, like, you know, has to take a moment, give them the space to struggle with it. Yes, um, that's that's the key. We, there are so many newer salespeople that. As soon as a prospect gets uncomfortable, they try and alleviate discomfort. That is not what zero pressure is about. I talk about zero pressure selling. It is not about zero discomfort selling. We have to examine some hard things in and, and anything except an impulse purchase. When we're talking about a significant purchase, we're dealing with some bigger issues in our prospect's life. If, if, this, pros, if this purchase is something they really have to think about, we're dealing with something that's a big deal to them. Why would we expect them to be able to gloss over the, the hard things about this? Why would we expect to be able to emotionally breeze through this area? No, we want, we're here to help them do that work of like getting through the, it sounds kind of woke to say this, but the emotional labor of, of dealing with this, the, the thinking process. Woke. Thinking is hard. Yeah, thinking is hard. Let's help people out a little bit. Let's, let's help remove some of the load for, for the thinking stuff. No, and, and it, it, I think the, the idea of that being woke is, is apropos because we, we do need to struggle as, as humans to really learn and appreciate, to, to appreciate what we have. Yeah. Part of the maturity process. It is. Mm-hmm. It, it truly is. And as a salesperson, it, it's it when what I teach salespeople is you ask a question and then shut up. Just stop talking. Exactly. Well, it, it gets silence. I'm like, yeah, get comfortable with the silence. It's what we need to do because that is the space for them to figure out if it's something that's real. And we're not. We're not putting pressure on them to be um, purposefully uh, uncomfortable, but we are putting pressure on them to be uncomfortable to think about something in a way that they haven't. And then they realize, oh, wow, this is, wow. And then they start to make those connections in their mind 
And if we can help them go all the way through that, then they can see it may be a little faster than they would. Maybe they get there because we've asked them some tough questions. I mean, what I was taught was it should not be a comfortable experience for the prospect. They should, they should be thinking about things that make them uncomfortable. Now, we don't want them crying and stuff, right? Or that's not a, that's not our goal. Depending on the fun, depending on the business. Well, to, if you're a clinical hypnotist, then if they're crying, they're buying is very true. Yes, yeah. right. But, uh, yeah, for, for B2B stuff, generally not. But if they're buying a vacuum cleaner or uh, if they, they need to fix the manufacturing process, we don't need them crying. We need them to be like, holy crap, this is costing me $50,000 a month. Right. Awe is a useful emotion yeah. in a sales process. But even then, like, you know, if, if, if we get to, I was listening to a sales call from a, a salesperson the other day, and they got to the point where it's a $50,000 a month problem. And he mm-hmm. assumed that that was a big, big problem. Right? Right. And I'm like, right. well, you didn't. And he didn't ask. He didn't ask. He's like, is that, is that a lot of money? And had he done that, he might have learned that, no, it's really not. Because I have this other problem over here that's costing me $150,000 a month, right? So maybe that's the priority, and then we come back to the $50,000 problem. We don't know. And, and taking away those assumptions uh, is what we, what, we really, uh, what we really need to do with what, in our space, is, is trying to coach people to do those things. Um, and then as a salesperson, it's, it's really following that through. And I'd be interested on on your take on this, uh, David Sandler, who's an old. Oh yeah. Uh, you can't teach a kid to ride a bike at a seminar. That was the book, um, but he had a great quote. Another one: uh, um, "Sales is a Broadway show performed by a psychiatrist." Yep. <laughs> and yep. If you think about it, that can go badly because then you're. You know, you're trying to do this big the- theatrics and things, but it, what he really meant was, w- we're acting, right? Yeah. Um, he was a, he was a, and, and and I think most of us, I'm a shy person. I don't really enjoy being the center of attention. I had to do a speech the other day at a at a great friend's funeral, and I it was incredibly uncomfortable. Um, it's because it was a funeral, but because I had to talk to so many people. Right, right. I don't you. enjoy that. Um, but when when we're on and we're supposed to be giving them 100% of our, uh, you know, our time and our mind and, and be really there in the moment, it's, there is a certain amount of like, do I really care if this guy's manufacturing problem, right? But I, I do in the moment because I'm trying to help him if he wants help. If he doesn't want help, I'm out of there. I don't. I don't need to hang around. But it, I think that's a, a a piece of it. And then the psychiatrist aspect is, we're, we we got to pay attention to what they're saying, right? If you have NLP training, then you you're listening to the words, must have as opposed to it would be nice to have, right? Those are wildly different things. And if are they running a movie in their head, or they you know are they looking at images, right? How are they how are they seeing things? Um, yeah. What's, what's the actual literal internal experience for them and h- how closely can we access that? Yeah. And we don't need to be a NLP or right. It helps, but just being patient and not trying to go so fast and stop talking about our damn products. Um, <laughs> the, there's a few, when I first discovered Sandler, I was late to the game probably, but well, definitely. But um, I felt a bit like I'd found a kind of a philosophical home to some extent. Uh, Sandler, uh, James Muir, the Challenger stuff, mm-hmm. and then uh, Claude Whitaker and one other guy, uh, Peter Bork wow. of Unsettling. Um, th- those folks, they, they kind of... Most of them are more enterprise focused than I am. I, I tend to be more small business, although we have one or two enterprise clients. And they, uh, I, I just, I, it was such a nice feeling understanding that we can, there are other people out here teaching a zero pressure approach or teaching, a, like, let's actually listen and 
find ways to find ways to care. Mm. That was really what it came it came down to for me. The the Broadway show stuff to me from Sandler, not to over interpret that that quote, but um like we need to evoke feelings. We're not here to evoke analysis. That's not what a Broadway show is about. It's it's designed any kind of a show is designed to evoke emotion. So we're moving people from the world of analysis and calculation and paralysis a lot of times into the world of imagination and action. And so doing that, I mean, you have to be patient with people's feelings. They, they don't happen just because you mentioned a magic word. There are no magic words, only magic feelings. Mm. And so making sure that they are in that spot. Oh, man, one easy example. An enterprise sale that takes three calls to close and four emails to schedule those calls and to remind people and et cetera and get multiple people involved from the committee and stuff like that. When you come back on your second call, um, there, there is a danger, a, a strong danger with most salespeople that I've trained that they're, they're going to want to recap quickly and then move on to the next step. But if you got somewhere in that first call, you're not here to recap you're here to reaccess. You want to get someone back into a state where they can make an effective decision about this. So if you're just recapping, if you're running through a spiel, not going to happen. You are here to reaccess for the second call and sell either the third call or sell the product or sell whatever your next step is. But you have to be in that world of imagination and action every every single time. That's the only thing that gets action. If you found that emotion before, you have to get them back into that state by tugging on that string or whatever that was, and then and then confirm. Is this right. still a problem? Is this still something that we okay? Then you know maybe we can maybe we can still help, but let's let's keep moving forward cautiously. But if you don't see that and hear that in that prospect's mind, right, and the words and body language, right, because body language is like one of the biggest components of communication. Um, Zoom is so nice over the phone. It's harder on the phone, but that's what we used to do. We didn't have this. Yep. We had, we had to do everything on the phone. Yeah. So you really had to listen. So some of us who, who were making calls and, and had to listen to people, um, you know, 30, 40 years ago, that was, a, a you know, a skill set that we had to, had to develop. I remember you, one of you the, learned to hear how, but you learned to hear someone's posture even. Yeah. Like you can hear them stand up. You can hear them sit back in the chair. You can hear them yeah. like it's, it's survival. You have to learn. Yeah. It. <laughs> I, 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 there were lines that you could use years ago that you can't use anymore. Right. Um, uh, like, we could make phone calls from a phone booth on the street, right? Um, I was in New York, so you would sometimes you would pop into the phone booth to call the office to see if you had any messages, and um, <laughs> you could use the line when you called the when you called the prospect back, you know, when you got somebody to pick up and like, well, let me see if he's in the office. Um, Is it raining where you are? No, I'm in the office. Like, okay, it's, it's pouring here, and I'm I'm in the phone booth, so take your time. And, you know, people would start to move a little right. bit. Um, right. And those things are gone um, uh, just due to the nature of technology, which is fine. But um, I, I, I think the, the other thing I wanted to kind of talk to you about was, and, and we've, we've talked around it, the idea of coaching people to be better at what they're doing as opposed to training retraining their mind about going about this way is better than your way. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I was trained as a Sandler guy. I've read, you know, everything from every version of IBM. I've gone through the challenger stuff. I mean, some of it resonates, um, more than others. Um, the gap selling Keenan stuff, bronze stuff. Right. And they're all an amalgamation, amalgamation, they're all a blend of everything else that came. Even Sandler's stuff is a blend sure, of things that sure. came before them. And, and so is mine and so is yours. Yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, people are people and they always will be, right? But it, so it's, it's about trying to find to that one thing that helps them get better. Because unfortunately, 
so many salespeople are awful at the, the what they do. And it's not necessarily their fault because often they haven't been given any help. And the, the bar is so low. I mean, I'm a perfect example. Like, what am I going to do when I graduate? I graduate college with an economics degree. That sets me up for grad school. But I didn't have any money for grad school. So I could... I, I, sold stuff in the past. I worked in various retail places and I newspapers and whatnot. So I figured I could do it. I was dumb enough to think I could do it. So <laughs> so much of entrepreneurship is about that. <laughs> it is. But, so, I'm the same way. But your approach is, I think, similar, right? You're trying to coach people to think differently about what they're doing and to approach it slightly differently. Can you I, share that? I am careful to separate my personal call structure from what needs to be happening on any sales call. When I do a call review, me, me and my coaches have a seven layer approach to, to doing a sales call review. And we basically it's the, the seven layers of the sales call overhaul. So uh, structural integrity, like do you have all the pieces that need to be there in a sales call? Emotional horsepower. Are you really getting torque on the problem? Are you getting people from calculation into imagination? Is that actually happening? Yes, it can be hard to measure, but you must learn to calibrate to that. Where are you? And and are you getting people where you need to go over the tipping point in that aspect? The framing dynamics. Are we setting a good frame for credibility? Do we need authority in this frame? Do we need expertise in this in this frame? Are we missing any of those things? Are we being a jerk by trying to come in as too high authority? Mm -hmm. That happens a lot in the, uh, in the biz op space, which I've had a few clients in that space. Um, the biz op space tends to be very condescending to its prospects. And to, to be fair, the gurus get sucked into that a lot of times by prospects being very immature business owners, mm -hmm. but just not knowing there may be business owners in the biz op space. That's what it is. So, okay. But you have to be careful about that, not to get cynical about it, you know? Sure. Um, so handhold, but don't, don't get cynical and patronizing. Um, so do we have the right framing dynamics? Are we grinding gears? Are we moving from one section of the call to another too fast? Sandler is, I mean, they've got the submarine with the seven compartments and everything. So they're very explicit and formal about that. I don't tend to be nearly as formal about it, but like, are you covering things before you move into the next area where you, you need to get stuff. The objection catalyst, like are we, are we rebutting or handling people around objections or are we actually transforming those objections? Are we anticipating them? Are we preempting them? Are we catalyzing those objections? And I mean, any experience on a funnel after 20 or 30 sales calls on a funnel, it does not take long. You ought to know what your big objections are. If you're if you don't know what the big objections are, you've got an introspection problem, mm -hmm. and you need to you need to start paying a bit more attention to the to the game film, you know, the game tape. Sure. So, all right, we know we're going to get asked these things. How do we bring it up before somebody asks it, so we can we can control or aid in the framing of the thought in the first place? Um, Misfires and trap phrases are basically, are you painting yourself into weird corners that you shouldn't be in? Or are you leaving yourself a way out? Um, and then rapport spark. Most of my people, they, we call them givers. Uh, and a lot of times when people come to me, they're givers stuck in a taker process. They don't know a better way to deal with things. And so they have a very, they have an unnatural feeling process for them uh, because they are, they're focused on, well, I don't know. There, there are a lot of ways to describe a taker process, but I'll, I'll stop there. But most givers tend to be very good at rapport. And so you don't need six minutes of icebreaker at the beginning. I mean, it, we, we can't afford that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you don't, you don't need to focus on that most of the time. Usually I'm tamping people down on rapport and telling them, look, find your rapport in the problem itself. Mm -hmm. Find your rapport in deep conversation, not how, how about those chiefs, you know? Right. And just it, it, like talk about things that matter. I hate small talk so much. 
I'm not particularly introverted. I'm, I'm a little more extroverted on, on that scale, but I cannot stand small talk. The cocktail conversation stuff drives me nuts. Boring. And so, yeah, it's boring. And I just realized, oh, it doesn't matter. So if a prospect needs to talk about the weather and where I live when I get on with them just to feel comfortable, okay, that's fine. Yeah, but uh, the, like, I'll, I'll give it to them for their sake, but I'm not doing it for my sake right. by any means. But if you're, it depends upon where you are in the world, right? So I, I in New York, yeah. what do you want, right? Right. That's the question. Right. And when I yep. moved to Atlanta, I was it sort of took a year to kind of figure out what I wanted to do. And as a buddy of mine said, hey, we need some help. You know, I need you to go pretend you're a sales guy and do some consulting work for us. And that was different. Like, they wanted to know a little bit about who you were, right? Because I was a Yankee. Um, that didn't sound like them. This was back when Atlanta hadn't been completely transformed, right? It was still some... Some places that were were still south. Uh, well, there still is, but there were a couple of places I went that were freaking scary um, yeah. south. Um, so, I mean, Stone Mountain, the south of Atlanta, is the birthplace of the Klan, right? So you've got some really wild dynamics going on around that. Yeah, city, I was in one of those people. guys' offices, uh, quite frankly. Yeah, um, which yeah. I. Uh, I, I called the, my buddy up and said, hey, man, I had an objection today, and I explained it to him. Was, and he's like, oh, all you had to do is say, hey, I was told that uh, um, whenever I meet an asshole, I get to take the rest of the afternoon off. So all you had to do is say, hey, I'm going to tell him that, and then say you're going to go play golf the rest of the afternoon. And I'm like, there you go. this guy could have buried me someplace on his property, and nobody would have ever <laughs> found me. So I'm not yeah. doing that. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I, I agree with you. The whole rapport thing is you, you establish that with, with, with the questions and the discovery process and the qualification process. And I like to fall back. I don't want to lean into somebody. I don't want to, I don't want to push it. Um, but somebody says to me, it seems like you're not really, you're, you don't really want to sell this to me. And I'm like, why would you say that? And right, because now they're right. kind of coming right. towards me, but I think it's about using this, using our skills in a way that we we need to help people. Um, and you know, if you come from South Georgia, that's sort of the nature of of people there. Weather aside, right, because it it is hot um, and sweaty. Like I would, I would leave my house and walk to my car, and I would be to soaking wet from sweat just. The time I was in Atlanta, um, crazy. Yeah, and that's North Georgia. That's that's a good six degrees cooler than South Georgia most of the time. I've stopped in Valdosta yeah. and on my way to Florida, yep. and holy crap, that's, that's close to where I grew up. Yeah, yeah, it's a, uh, it's hot. Um, mm -hmm. So, but not uh, being so. In, in answer to the the original question, there the, the frame versus the the how to think differently. We do offer frames like that. I do have opinions on that stuff, but my opinion doesn't matter nearly as much as are, are we getting everything in there that has to happen. And so if people have a structure that works pretty well for their company and the salespeople just aren't getting uh, traction in that structure, it is likely that we can adjust the, the salesperson within the existing frames rather than having to create an entirely new process from scratch. So we, I mean, do... The minimum effective dose, right? right. You, you take two ibuprofen when you can. You don't take nine ibuprofen. Like you, you do as little as you can to get the result that you need, and then you stop, well, and you adjust, and you, you assess, and then see, okay, what's our next step? Where do we go next to leverage the, the funnel or to increase client lifetime value or access a new market or et cetera? So, it's about yeah. making sure certain principles are there and yes. certain aspects mm -hmm. of 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 good selling is part of their structure. And I think that's really the beginning of a sales career beyond, beyond a, a grinder or a script monkey. Um, when you go from that level of just, all right, I got my script. I got my 400 dials a day. If you're a recruiter or, or old school cold calling, yeah. uh, um, but being able to move even while you're in that structure at that company, being able to move from, all right, I do these mechanical things, I get this result. Um, being able to start understanding why these things work and 
when they don't work, why they didn't work. Like that's really when people start a career in like true selling, like being able to be a giver in sales rather than the, the script monkey type approach. It, it, I think that's a really good way to look at that and a good creativity, yeah. creativity. Mm-hmm. It, it, because, and, and you're doing some self analysis as well. It's like, you know, that didn't go as well. What did I, what did I do differently? Right. That, I was like, Oh, I put, that piece before that piece and i I've, I've completely forgot to ask that question right and and the order matters usually it's not always linear but there's certain aspects it's hard to get to the decision criteria if we if we know we're not talking to somebody that's part of that decision criteria so i mean whatever the language is i think being able to pivot and adjust um and if they don't have a structure, we can help them with it, depending upon where they are in the, the piece. So I really, I, I think your approach um, is is truly helpful to an entrepreneur who's trying to get that next step with, you know, they're trying to make a hire and they're like, they do all these things in their head and they're trying to take it out yeah. of their head and put it into like, give it to the next person. And it's like, that's harder than what people think you know sticking the straw in the air and sucking out all the good stuff that's hard to it's hard to do without some sort of framework to work with it so i i say that founder fuel runs dirty like we can start anything we can or or founders make dirty deals i say that a lot too Hmm. we we make up stuff on the fly we have the authority to do so we have the knowledge to do so we know what our capacity is internally to deal with this thing we know what we can afford. Actually, a lot of times founders make terrible deals as well where they lose money, but that's part of the learning process. Right. But a salesperson, they don't have the authority to do that. Like how many founders would come down hard on a salesperson for going out of bounds on a deal or making the wrong deal when the boundaries were never even expressed in the first place? Hard to get like, mad that's at, hard. It's hard to get mad at somebody for doing something you didn't tell them they couldn't do. You didn't tell them they couldn't do. Yep. I mean, it's really, yep. Uh, but people do it all the time. Yeah. But it's, 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 you know, it's, is the expectations set properly. Um, like somebody's yeah. like, Hey, I need help with accountability. Great. Love to help you with accountability. Let me ask you a couple of questions. What are you holding yeah. them accountable to? Well, yeah. A, B and C. Okay. Um, are those the right things? We think so. Okay, let's pretend they are. Did you tell them that's what you want them to do? Well, they should know. Ah. Ah. Okay. (laughs) So your three-year-old, when they touch the hot pan on the stove, they should know that they shouldn't do that. Well, no, we got to teach them. Oh. How how is this different? You make the assumption that salespeople know what to do and they're just going to magically come in and do what, what you want them to do. And that's not fair. It's why salespeople fail. Um, and I think there's a responsibility of entrepreneurs to be able to, hey, these are the three big objections we get. And here's how we handle those things. Here's our story about uh, how, how, how we structure our, our company story. And this is what we're good at. These are the things we're not good at. And we have our competitors that do these things, and this is how we line up. And more importantly, this is who we're really good at helping. This is our ideal client. This is the persona, whatever language you need to use. But if we don't have that, how are we create an accountability? Um, it's a it's a wonderful uh, it's a wonderful thing. So I I I think this has been a fun conversation. We could probably have you back and talk about seven or eight different things um, going back and forth. I'd love to. This has been a blast. This has been really fun for me, too. Yeah, we Thank can you. just kind of geek out. Um, but mm-hmm. it, us geeking out might be helping somebody else is kind of how I look at it. So That's the goal, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, I usually ask every guest this question. Um, past or present, does Jeremy have a relationship with cigars? Ah. Well, let's see. Um I've got a couple different connections, I guess we could say. Um, one is with cigarettes, which is a very loose connection. I was a clinical hypnotist for 10 years, so I helped hundreds and hundreds of people stop smoking. I had, Good um, work. What, what, in fact, one of the ways that I sold around that was when someone was coming in for a free consult to figure out if they wanted to work with me to stop smoking, um, I had a giant mesh garbage pail in the middle of the office 
and it was kind of the showpiece where, where people would throw it, uh, throw away their stuff after they stopped. Um, usually the first session, um, after we were done, I would push back and say, okay, take a look. All right, it's been a little while since your last SIG. Um, how do you feel? Take a look. Put it in your mouth. I mean, we'd, we'd go through a lot of the motions to really test, are we done here? And so once, once people were convinced, nope, I'm really done, we would toss it in the garbage can. And I had to... Uh, I had to empty it out from time to time because it kept filling up. And it's so good. it was it was a fun showpiece. It it really helped make the sale. The other one is the um very fond memories of sitting around on the front step of the college dorm. Uh most of the other freshmen were smokers. And um so just having you know, useless philosophical discussions and kind of figuring out what we wanted problems. to do with life. Yeah, all all those things. And then um, one of my favorite things now is sitting around the fire pit on a little bit of a chilly night with two or three friends. I'm not enough of an extrovert to want to party all the time. Mm -hmm. So I I like hanging out with one to five people. And that fire pit is kind of my my ideal scenario. And so a lot of my friends that I do that with, uh, they'll smoke a cigar while while we do that. So that's kind of what it evokes for me. It's a cool social environment to engage with people and take some time to uh, enjoy a cigar so you can have a meaningful conversation with somebody. I love it. Um, so, Jeremy, what you're, I think our, our, the people that we like to speak to are kind of in the similar entrepreneurial. So if you could share like who it is you love to help and then what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Sure. Uh, the best way to reach out to me is salescalloverhaul.com. Okay. Um, and I, you can, I think you can spell it either way, but overhaul is O V E R H A U L.com. Uh, so that'll get you in touch with me. Um, I'm on Facebook as well. I, I don't really hang out anywhere, but Facebook and in, in my own email, but, um, I like helping I call my people aces, so agency founders, um, course creators, experts, and then SaaS founders. That kind of tends, it, it's almost more my network and my friends than, than a, an explicit avatar, mm -hmm. but that's who I tend to help. And they, they tend to be anywhere from a quarter million dollars a year up to around the 20 or $30 million a year range, uh, depending on what they need and et cetera. But if you're a solo founder, um, hiring your first team, that's often when I get called. So uh, okay. help install the sales ops system and what KPIs matter and some, some of the stuff we talked about. Today. And giving them the right tools and the messaging to, to make the calls yeah. and how to measure the exactly. success. Awesome. All right. Uh, we'll have all of that in the show notes. Um, thank you. This was fun. We'll, we'll figure out a way to um, get you back to have another uh, geek out conversation. Be cool. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. To get your copy of Walter Crosby's new book, The Seven Critical Mistakes CEOs Make with Their Sales Organization That Stop the Company from Scaling, follow the link in the show notes or go to Amazon.com. Thank you for listening to Sales and Cigars with Walter Crosby of Helix Sales Development. For more on Sales and Cigars, remember to like, share, and subscribe. Sales and Cigars, produced by thepodcastproshop.com.